Let's give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. May all our believers abroad also greet each other. Jesus is with you eternally. With this word, today's message is entitled, Do Not Let Your Hearts Harden. Yesterday, the establishment Thanksgiving service of Hugh Healing Lounge was held, and I proclaimed the message titled, The Courtyard of Healing. The concept is for a healing specialized church to be established as a specialized church for field ministry. And this healing lounge is located next to the NC department store at Boston Station. And right beside it is a park, and it's also close to the main church. And because Boston Station is located right there, the accessibility is very good. So people, when it comes to addicts, they are afraid to come to church. And they may fear meeting people. So firsthand, we, it, could, it, it would be easy to invite them there and have them receive biblical rest. And especially the Healing Specialized Church focuses on addiction ministry. Addiction refers to a deeply fallen state of habituation to something. When they've deeply fallen state of into habituation in something. In fact, various types of addiction are so serious in our country that our country is often referred to a republic of addiction. Representative examples are alcohol, drugs, gambling, sex, and internet addiction. These are called the five major addictions. And addiction experts estimate that approximately there are nine people who are addicted in our country. They are 9 million people are addicted to one of the five major addictions and one in five people are addicts. But the greater issue with addiction is that it's not the problem of the individual alone, but it causes greater pain to the family members and also leads to societal problems. Healing addiction begins with one's acknowledgement of being addicted. I have been addicted to admit that is the start of healing. Additionally, people and families in similar situations are needed. The cooperation of people and families in similar situations are needed. So the Healing Specialized Church opened the Hugh Healing Lounge to naturally create this kind of environment. And of course, all our other churches were also established on their own, but our pastor, Hek Young Park, and she knew she knew the importance of addiction healing and she trained herself and educated herself and became a pastor and established this healing specialized church and i saw this time how well it was established how even the members they all came with one heart and one mind and they prepared every single thing on their own and all our church had to do was install a signboard for them all the rest were they did out of their own pockets and devotion and they even gave a hundred, a uh, hundred accounts of the two through seven healing. And I heard, I, I felt like they are really awake disciples, and they are really awakened church officers and ministers. They all educated themselves in these healing, healing aspects. So they're special specialized individuals in all aspects of healing whether it's counseling or exercise and so they all came together and established this healing ministry so this is a model that the yewon community has shown a model of dedication and devotion and a model of a specialized church in my opinion for the Hugh Healing Lounge shop been established in the field as soon as the start 10,000 2025 was declared is because God will give important answers of the start 10,000 2025. In fact, when one addict is healed and restored, 
even all the family members return to the Lord, it becomes a platform. And the same goes for bone and flesh evangelism. When one person returns to the Lord, when an important individual in the family returns to the Lord, the entire family becomes evangelized. It becomes the answer of Acts 16.31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. If that individual is really one who believes in the Lord, then and prays for the evangelization of the family, you have to pray for the family evangelization. Why don't you pray for your family? If people say, oh, I don't care whether my family is saved or not, that person does not know the gospel. It's not because they're, it may seem like that person is going to church, but in the inside, that person is not believing in Jesus because one who believes in Jesus cannot say that. What did Paul say? Paul said that even if I was to be cut off, I desire for my family and relatives to believe in Jesus. And so, and he, Jesus himself, Jesus himself, that he, Jesus himself, even, oh, even he said that, oh, I, I wish that all my family and relatives may come to Jesus. This is the confession of one who truly believes in Jesus. to pray for your blood and flesh evangelization. Today's title is, Do Not Let Your Hearts Harden. For one's heart to be hardened means that one has become spiritually insensitive. They are numb. When they first believed in Jesus, they did feel a little bit, but after having believed in Jesus for decades, even when they pray, their hearts don't beat, their, and even when they pray, when they receive the word, they don't have any assurance of answers. No matter how many times they listen to the word, they don't feel anything. It's a state of being spiritually insensitive. They, their hearts have hardened. Verse 52, the last verse of today's passage, Mark expresses the spiritual state of the disciples as follows. He said, For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. The disciples, the, it, this passage was, it follows a time where, the, it, where it was a less than a day after the disciples had experienced the miracle of the five loaves and two fish. And these people, they had seen this miraculous event. And despite having just experienced the amazing works of recreation, these, the works of miracle that only God himself could do, less than a day after it had happened, they, they had become spiritually insensitive. And they completely sink in the face of problems and, and, insensit and incidents because they were spiritually dumb. And they came and they went back to their original state. They did, they did not believe in the Almighty God. And they had no interest in their own lives. The proclamation of start 10,000, 2025, and the establishment of Hugh Healing Lounge has taken place. And next week, the Pakistan Missions Camp will officially take place as well. The church is currently making a covenantal challenge with one heart, whole heart, and continuation for the evangelization of 237 nations and 5,000 tribes. But what is important is for all of you to taste the blessing of this answer. I must also taste this answer in the field. Answers are not something that someone spoon feeds you. There is no such answer. You must participate in the line of answers. You must participate in the line of answers. If your hearts become hardened, you will not experience answers. You will not receive answers because your hearts have hardened. I bless all you believers of Yangwon Church in the name of the Lord to be spiritually awake and enter a life that creates a life masterpiece of 24-hour, 25-hour, and eternity through today's word. Point number one, a life awake by prayer. Let's look at verse 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. 
and after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. Today's passage connects to last week's passage of the five loaves of bread and two fish miracle. Interestingly, after Jesus performed the miracle, he immediately urged his disciples. He was so he was in a hurry that he immediately urged his disciples to get into the boat and go across to Bethsaida. What was the reason for that? Although it's not recorded in today's passage, John 6 that records the same content. We see that after Jesus performed such an astounding miracle of feeding over 20,000 people with just two fish, five loaves of bread, and even having 12 baskets left over, the people, the people who had been fed with that food, the people who were in that field, wanted to make Jesus their king, the king of Israel. The crowd to experience this miracle firsthand began to stir. They were becoming excited, and they thought, wow, how could this happen? Oh, this Jesus, whom we only had heard about the news about, is indeed real. And because we are under Roman oppression, and we have no freedom, but this person has power. If he becomes the king of Israel, then we will be free from all Roman oppression, and he'll solve all our problems of food and clothes. They thought that he would solve all their political and physical problems. This was, was the messianic expectations that the Jews had, even going back their ancestors, that they believed that the Messiah would come and make them happy, thinking about the physical resolutions. And the disciples who were with this crowd might have also felt a sense of pride because once they had done what Jesus had told them to do, they were the ones who fed the 20,000 people and they saw it firsthand in the field. And they didn't know how it, the, the Bible doesn't really give us a described, a detailed explanation of how they distributed the bread and fish, but it could have been that they kept breaking off pieces and distributing them, and miraculously more kept appearing. Think about it, how excited would the disciples would have been? And everyone was full, and the disciples were used as main figures in that. So imagine how excited they would have been. And I'm sure, from a worldly perspective, they would have been so proud of themselves. And if it, if it were you and I, I'm sure that we would have been even more prideful than the disciples. In the minds of the disciples, they were filled with the earthly things. The people, the disciples, they were all so consumed by the things of the earth. The introductory things, the visible things of the world, that was all their interest. But most people who go to church these days, that's all they care about, the visible things, the physical things, the earthly glory. They're all filled with that. And I'm sure the people there would have also praised the disciples. They would have said, oh, how amazing. And they probably would have thought that if they were to crown Jesus as king, they would at least hold high-ranking positions, perhaps a general position. However, Jesus' goal for coming to this earth was not simply to solve political and economic issues, but he came to solve the problems that humans cannot solve themselves, the fundamental problems of man. And that is why Jesus had to dismiss the crowds that were so consumed and engulfed by the physical things and immediately told the disciples to leave. And Jesus, after having the disciples go across by boat, Jesus himself went to the mountain to pray. Luke 22:39. We see that Jesus followed his habit of praying. This demonstrates that Jesus' life was completely integrated with prayer. Mark 1.35 says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. 
Who is Jesus? He is God himself who performed the miracle of the five loaves and two bread. But it said, there he prayed. And in today's passage, we see that after completing his ministry, he once again went to the mount to pray. His start and end were marked with prayer. May you start and end your day with prayer. May you start your day with prayer and end with prayer. That is the life that goes with Jesus, that God has showed us. No matter how busy you are, you must start your day with prayer and end your day with prayer. You must go to bed as you pray. That's what needs to take place. And I'm sure you already do that. At least when it comes to our Yewon believers, I'm sure that that's what you do. When Jesus performed the miracle of the five loaves and two fish, what did he do? He gave a congratulatory message. What that was, was that he gave a thanksgiving prayer to God. If you look at Luke 6, 12, we can see Jesus prayed to God all night, and then he called the disciples when the day came. He did not just do his works. He didn't follow his emotions and feelings, but he prayed all night, and then he called the disciples. And he, Jesus also prayed before he carried the cross. He did not just pray, but he was praying so earnestly as if his, that his sweat became blood. And when, even when he was hanging on the cross, he prayed before God. Jesus never ceased prayer. In other words, we can see that the life of Jesus started with prayer, proceeded with prayer, and concluded with prayer. His life was one of 24-hour prayer. What is the characteristic of, of people who pray? Or people who don't pray, they, they always turn to humanism. They try to do things on their own. But a person who prays does not speak a lot. They don't give reasons. But before God, they stand before God because God is the Almighty and He does everything. There's no reason to be deceived, to fall into trial. That's what you're basically saying, that you don't pray, that you have no spiritual strength. Through today's scripture, Mark contrasts the fact that Jesus went to the mountains to pray while the disciples' hearts were hardened. Jesus went to pray and the disciples' hearts were hardened. What this means is that the way for our hearts not to be hardened and for us to be spiritually awake and for us to live this walk of faith with, with a lot of power and to grow spiritually. And no matter how many other Christians may try to learn other methods and strategies, what is most important for us to do that is to pray. It is the spiritual ministry between me and God, an individual who has that, is very strong, is confident. He has a lot of courage. They don't care about what others might think and follow what others might do. But in prayer, they believe that God is with me and that it's between them and God. In everything we do, whether our words or actions, we must be a person of prayer who communicates with God. There are a few writings about prayer, and they convey very important meanings to us. Listen carefully. The scariest conceit of all is the conceit of not praying. Prayer is fulfilling the will and blueprint of life, which is God's sovereignty towards me as opposed to my own greed. When prayer is absent, our hearts become heavy with the things of the world. And when prayer is present, our hearts become filled with the Holy Spirit and the things of heaven. The method to form the greatest connection you could have in this world is prayer. In a place where prayer is absent, only people work. And in a place where prayer is present, God works. A place without prayer is a feast of Satan, while a place with prayer is a morning house of Satan. Amen. And so a place where prayer is absent is a festival for Satan, but a place where prayer is present, it is a morning house for Satan. And so why do problems arise? It's because 
Satan is working upon that. If you have family worship, there's no reason for those things to happen. So what does it say is the method to form the greatest connection in this world? People say you need connections in the world. What is the way to have that greatest connection? To meet people who have a lot of money, a lot of power, a lot of authority? Is that what it says? What does it mean to have great connections? It is to pray. If you rely on people, that means that you do not rely on God. A person who looks upon people do not, does not look upon God. Because a person who looks upon God does not look upon people. They're not interested in people. They're not interested in what others have to say. They're all interested in what God has to say and what God's word says. And so to pray before God is to make the greatest connection. Even if you may have no background in your workplace, you have no power, no money, and others are, and you see that others are getting promoted and they treat others food and things aren't working out for others, but you, things aren't working out for you. It is God who has made Joseph a governor. What, why, why did that take place? Because Joseph prayed. And so when Joseph was falsely accused, did he stop praying? No, he continuously prayed. And so God gave him the wisdom, the knowledge to be able to interpret the king's dream. And so, but people who do not pray, they have nothing in the world. And so a child of God, if, if you don't pray, then things don't work out and things still don't work out and still you don't pray. You have this, this stubbornness to not pray. Then whose loss is that? Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3 reads, God says to us, call to me and I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. You must pray. If something unjust has happened, you must pray. The Almighty knows everything. Tell everything to the Almighty because the Almighty will solve everything. There's no reason to give excuses and reasons. Just pray because God will just finish everything accordingly. If you're trying to live a good walk of faith and yet things are hindering you, the church needs to revival, but there's someone disturbing and hindering that, don't worry, just pray. because it is God who will judge them accordingly. And so all those who hindered Reverend Yu's ministry, they all left. I know all of them very well. In the early days of his ministry, there were people who continuously persecuted him and hindered him, but they all ended up having to pass in their early 30s and 40s. And so did Reverend Yu pray for something to happen to them? No, all he did was just pray. And I won't go into more specifics. Prayer is a spiritual science. It's a spiritual science. And it means that it will bring clear results. If there is no communication with God, even if it seems things are going well in people's eyes, it, is, it just eventually becomes a great strategy. because the humanly methods, they all end with resentment. It all just ends with exhaustion. To rely on people, to rely on manly methods, that was what, that was the history of, of the Israelites. But when they relied on God, God showed them their works. But when they relied on other things, on, on powerful nations like Rome, and bribed them and gave them offerings, they all perished. Jesus, God, made it so that they became captives. May you all live a life that is awake by prayer. May you become a 24-hour prayer nature and experience the answers of the field God has prepared and not lose hold of any single answers. Point number two, restoration of absolute faith. Let's look at verse 47. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. The disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee, following the word of Jesus, were making headway painfully through the wind against them. Many used to be fishermen who had experienced all sorts of har hardship at the Sea of Galilee. However, they could not even think of anything to do. 
from a Jewish perspective, it said the fourth watch and the fourth watch of the night refers to the time between 3 and 6 a.m. in the early morning. And when the disciples left, it was early in the evening. So what that means, even if they were to have left at 9 p.m. at night, that would mean they were struggling for an extensive six hours or more. The width of the Sea of Galilee is around 10 kilometers. And seeing how they were in the middle of the sea, it means that they had barely managed to move four to five kilometers forward because the width was so strong. If you look at Mark 4, the disciples already had an experience of facing a storm. However, at that time, when there was a storm, they were with Jesus. Jesus was with them on the boat. And at that time, even though Jesus was with them, the disciples were afra afraid and they showed extreme unbelief and resented them. But now, they were not even with Jesus, so what would their hearts have been like? There was pain and fear, and now it had become a terror of death. However, Jesus did not just leave the disciples to be. In verse 48, a very important phrase appears. It said, he saw that they were making headway painfully. Jesus was on the mountain, and he was praying, and he knew what was happening to the disciples. He was on the mountain, but he knew what the disciples were going through. And if the disciples had known that Jesus knew what they were going through, I'm sure that they would not have been so engulfed by fear. They would have thought, oh, Jesus will save us. But they were afraid because they did not know. The resurrected Jesus still prays for us who are saved on the right hand of God, and He is with us through the Holy Spirit, and, and, he, and may you believe that He also knows all our fears and that He has guided you to this place. Verse 49 to 51 reads, But when they saw Him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw Him and were terrified. But immediately He spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And He got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. Jesus not only prayed for the disciples, but He solved the source of the problem. He walked on the sea, on, and he walked towards the disciples and gave them a message of comfort and liberation. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. What this means is for us to take courage and refrain from that very state of fear. S refrain from that very state of fear. Do not be afraid. And as Jesus got into the boat with them, the wind ceased. Because Jesus was with them, all the frustration, the despair, and fear, all the causes of that faded away, and a true peace came upon them. That's what worship is. When you worship, there's true peace. Here, the passage said the phrase, it is I. In Greek, it's ego eimi. What this means is, what this is, it is the same phrase that was spoken when God revealed himself to Moses in Exodus, when God said, I am who I am, ego eimi. We must remember that Jesus is God the creator himself who dominates and conquers all problems and incidents of the world. St. Augustine once said while observing the passage of Jesus' appearance, it said Jesus arrived while stepping on waves. It's true, right? He stepped on waves. What does that mean? As such, Jesus treads all hardships that upended one's life underfoot. All the unjust situations that you may have faced, Jesus steps on them. He treads on them. So may you pray today, God, all these problems, the suffering, may you tread on them. Why are you afraid, Christians? May you place all unbearable worries, concerns, and anxieties below the cross of Christ and tread on them. The cross has finished everything. Why are you continuously so engulfed in your thoughts? Are you still afraid, worried, and anxious? So this world creates fear, worries, concerns, and anxieties. 
May you wholeheartedly believe in Jesus who calms the ways and gives true peace. Isaiah 43 verse 2 reads, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. How perfect of a guarantee is this? You, the flame will not consume you, and even, there, even if there are storms and waters, it will not overwhelm you. God has never promised that Christians will never experience any hardships. Christians will face exper and experience hardships this also. They might pass through waters, through rivers, and walk through fires. There may be times for that, whether Christian or not. However, what must be made clear here is to believe that Jesus is our true protector and He is with us and He guides you as the Holy Spirit. He is your true protector and your helper. So be courageous. Even before fire, before the lion stand, before idols, be courageous. What is this? With Emmanuel and oneness. I bless all y e w o n believers in the name of the Lord to firmly establish an absolute partisan faith and to enlarge the tents of the church, region 237, and flesh and blood evangelism. This is a conclusion. We are holding communion today. And one of the biggest implications of communion is not to let our hearts harden. And so they are numb. When it comes to religion, you must not let your hearts harden. That's what communion is. Paul mentions communion through 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29, and he expresses its core significance. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You're proclaiming of the Lord's death. What evangelism mission, that's what evangelism mission is. Jesus Christ, who is life, he is the bread of life, and with his blood, we have been forgiven of our sins, and we have been given eternal life. Through communion, we engrave the truth of the salvation and the importance of a life that spreads this unique gospel. You are engraving that in your hearts, your souls, and your minds. The resolution to restore the field. We must not let our hearts harden spiritually. We must do everything in our power to not let our hearts harden spiritually. May you restore your hearts. That's arrogance to let your hearts harden. I bless all believers of Yemen Church in the name of the Lord to live a life awake by prayer with absolute faith and become the driving forces of Star 10,000 2025 that will enlarge the four main tents of char church region 237 and flesh and blood evangelism. At this time, we'll proceed to the communion. Pastors and elders, please guide us. The communion of Jesus was held the day before Jesus was seized to, and Jesus himself held this. He said that until the end of the earth, He tells us to continue this communion that commemorates His blood and His flesh. We who are saved, the children of God, He gives us the power and He has freed us and He has given us true peace and joy in our hearts. And all the fear and anxieties and the greed and envious envy of the world God has called us out of that and has given us the spiritual identity of a child of God. And may this communion be one where we restore that identity of a child of God. Let us pray. This is my flesh for you. May you commemorate this body to the ends of the earth. May all believers of Yawan Church Give thanks to the Lord, and we thank you for allowing us to be to have this communion together. When we take part in this communion, may all the unbelief in us completely crumble, and may all fears and anxieties in us completely crumble as well. And may all physical illnesses, mental illnesses, and scars of our heart be healed through this communion. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.